I'd like to begin today by inviting you to turn with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verses 1 to 4. John 13, verses 1 to 4. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them to the end. And the supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was coming from God and went to God. He rises from the supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. And if we read on, we see that he begins to wash the disciples' feet. What a lesson in humility for that, that, that is. In John chapter 13, it talks about uh, three times Jesus uh, invites us to do the same thing. Wash one another's feet three times in this chapter. It's a wonderful idea. The Lord's Supper was the Passover meal. On that Thursday evening, just before Jesus was crucified on the Friday following, when he knew his time had come, Jesus knew his time had come. Bread was unleavened bread. I want to read a few texts from Exodus from that first Passover. Exodus chapter 13 verse 3. Exodus chapter 13 verse 3. That first Passover must have been something. Can't imagine it. Plagues had uh, destroyed a lot of things in, in Egypt. And uh, Pharaoh was finally softening a little bit. He was about ready to let his people go, let the, God's people go. So Exodus chapter 13 verse 3. It says, And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord hath brought you up out from this place. There shall be no leavened bread be eaten. Leavened bread. Notice that. Exodus chapter 12, back of page. Exodus chapter 12, verse 39. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt. For it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry. Neither had they prepared themselves any victual. They hadn't prepared any food. They were about ready to be thrown out, right? It's a good throwing out. Pharaoh was tired of all this. A lot of plagues. Haste was involved here. If they used leaven, to make the, the dough rise, this takes all time, right? That was one of the reasons. Unleavened bread. Now verse 33. Chapter 12, verse 33. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. And they said, we be all dead men. It, looks like, uh, it looked like the Egyptians were all going to be destroyed. And they were ready to get out of there. Another one, Exodus chapter 10, back to chapter 10, 28 and 29. And Pharaoh said to them, get you up from me, take heed to yourself, see my face no more. For in that day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, you have spoken well. I will see your face again no more. And they were to have their staff in their hand and their shoes on their feet because they were ready to leave Egypt with the leavened, unleavened bread. So unleavened has to do with haste. That's one of the first things. No time for yeast to rise the dough. Bake it and leave. No leavened bread was to be eaten during the Passover. In fact, in the years to come, they were not even to have leaven in their houses. It was a, 
a terrible thing, for leaven is a symbol of sin. Christ's sinless life is everything to us. You know that? Christ's sinless life is everything to us. I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to read 7, 6, 7, and 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 6, 7, and 8. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? A little sin causes a lot of trouble, right? It soon becomes burgeoning, it becomes habits. All kinds of things happen as a result. Purge therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. This is the Passover. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of, what does it say? Sincerity and truth. Yeah, this is a solemn time for the children of Israel. Solemn time for us, too. His righteous life is the righteousness by which we are justified, by which we are forgiven. We call it the righteousness of Christ. His blood. And that righteous, from that righteous life is the sacrifice that lifts from us the wages of sin, which is death. Some wages, huh? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Wages. So today we eat bread. Jesus said, I am the bread. John 6, verse 35. In Moses' little sanctuary, in the first apartment, there were, was a two-room uh, tent arrangement in Moses' sanctuary. Later on, it was developed into Solomon's temple. And, and later on, uh, after the Babylonian captivity, they built another temple. And that temple had two rooms in it also, a holy place, a first apartment, and a second apartment. A holy place and a most holy place. And there was bread in that little sanctuary. It was a symbol, it was a symbolic prophecy of Jesus who was to come. In fact, the whole Old Testament is a gigantic prophecy of one who was to come and redeem us all from our sins. What an arrangement. And there was bread there. It was symbolic of a prophecy of Jesus who is the living bread. And every day we have the privilege of partaking of that life-giving bread. The prophet Jeremiah, he knew about this principle. He said, thy words were found. Whose words? God's words. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they were unto me, what? Can anybody finish that? The joy and rejoicing of my heart. Are you joyful this morning? Thankful this morning? It comes from God's word. It comes from, what does it mean to eat God's word? means to read it, ruminate on it, think about it, meditate upon it. We don't have to wait for communion Sabbath to, to eat bread. We can experience this joyful living presence always. In thy presence is the fullness of joy at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. And that happens as a result of eating this wonderful food that we call God's word. Set aside every day a little time to study God's word for the purpose of knowing him, whom to know is everlasting life. I can't imagine what it would be like to live forever. Can you imagine that? Living forever. We have, uh, you know, we're in the miserable business of burying one another. But in that place, we'll never grow old. I especially like that. The pathway of faith and trust and belief is through the word. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We, got, we receive faith that way. We're saved by grace through faith, right? So salvation is very dependent upon our being close to the word. This is the only real work that counts. <clears throat> I'd like to have you turn to John chapter 6. It talks about God's work. John 6, 6, verse 29. John 6, verse 29. 
Here's what it says. And Jesus said to them, this is the what? This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. Faith and belief are very closely related in the Bible. And we receive faith and belief by studying his word. As we study the word, we begin to know him. And we can't have faith in anybody we can't know, right? But he's made a provision for us to know him, whom to know is eternal life. So in the sanctuary, right across the room from the holy place, where the bread was on full display, there were flames of fire, the seven branched candlesticks to illuminate the bread. That room was lightened because of the, of the candlesticks. And the bread over here representing the word of God and the Holy Spirit represented by the fire. We should never open the Bible without doing what? Praying first, asking for the Holy Spirit to lighten the bread so we understand what, it, what it's saying to us. And uh, so the Holy Spirit sheds his light on the bread and we receive understanding and conviction and memory. I just love that memory one, don't you? <laughs> Anybody here forget something today? And inspires our prayers. The work of the Holy Spirit here is to show us Jesus and to connect us to him who is altogether righteous. We become holy by joining ourselves to him that is holy. And we do that through the word. On the west side of the holy place, that first apartment in that sanctuary, was God's living room. That's God's living room. And on the west side of God's living room was the altar of incense. Incense was ascending, associated in the Bible with ascending with the prayers of God's people. You can read about that in Psalms chapter 5 verse 8 and chapter 8 verse 2. We won't take the time to read that this morning. But these three things, study of the Bible, presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives and a prayer life is like a three-legged stool. Daily study of God's word, number one. Do you like a three-legged stool? I think that's pretty stable. Don't you think so? The second leg, the privilege and power of prayer. As the incense arises, our prayers have, accept, our prayers have acceptance with God. And then the lamps of fire representing our witness to others as the Holy Spirit gives us utterance. So, daily study of the Bible. This was a daily service. This took place every day in the sanctuary. Daily study of God's word. Developing a prayer life. In fact, Paul says we can pray without ceasing. We don't have to, have to uh, pray and then uh, forget about him the rest of the day, right? We don't want to do that. If we do that, why well, we lose him. You know, the job that, that uh, Mary and Joseph had was to keep their eyes on Jesus, right? And they didn't do that one day. They lost him and it took three days to find him again. Don't do that. Happened in Pilgrim's Progress, too. In that little book by, by Bunyan. So the incense represents the righteousness of Christ and our prayers ascend with that incense. Jesus is the sweet smelling savor, it says in Ephesians 5.2. He is righteousness personified and our prayers are perfumed with the incense as they ascend to the throne room of the universe. It's our connection to the throne of God as the incense ascended it in the sanctuary in the first apartment in that first room, it ascended and wafted over the holy place, over the curtain, over into the most holy place where the throne room is. Prayers are our pathway to the throne, perfumed by the incense of Christ's righteousness. Put your faith and trust in him. He's the living word. What a wonderful provision. I would like to read a passage to you from first selected messages. I don't read a lot here from this, but I would like to read this one this morning, 344. One selected messages. Here's what it says. It talks about prayer. Prayer. 
Christ, our mediator, and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding on man's behalf. Okay? He pleads for us, not as does Christ, but presents his blood and blood shed from the foundation of the world. The Spirit works upon our hearts, drawing out our praise and penitence and praise and thanksgiving. The gratitude flows from our lips, that flows from our lips is the result of the Spirit striking the chords of the soul in holy memories, awakening the music of the heart. That's beautiful language. The religious services, the prayers, the praise, the penitent confession of sin. You know, that's the best things we can do. I want to read that little list again. These are the best things we can possibly do in this life. The religious services. Okay, we can think of what that is. The prayers, the praise, the penitent confession of sin ascend from true believers. What kind of believers? True believers, ones who have connected themselves to Jesus as incense to the heavenly sanctuary, but passing through the corrupt channels of humanity, they are so defiled that unless they are purified by blood, they can never be of value with God. But the incense is really the righteousness of Christ, right? Notice what it says next. They ascend not in spotless purity, and unless the intercessor who is at God's right hand presents and purifies all by his righteousness, they are not acceptable to God. All incense from earthly tabernacles must be moist with the cleansing drops of the blood of Christ. We are so dependent. There isn't one thing we can do without, without um, that is acceptable to him without the incense of Christ's righteousness ascending with our service and our prayers and those things. Christ is our righteousness. He gives us a firm foundation to sit on, to stand on. I'd like to contrast a little personal experience, a little testimony from my past. When I was a boy, we had four or five milk cows. How many of you milked a cow by hand? Can I see your hands? Oh, you're admitting that. That's a long time ago. <laughs> we had four or five cows and they had to be milked by hand morning and evening. It was 24 seven, by the way. And we had a one-legged stool to sit on and a five-gallon or four-gallon milk bucket balancing ourselves sitting on that one-legged stool and the bucket between our two knees. Can you get the picture? And then the cow decides that she doesn't like what you're doing and she moves her foot just a little bit or a lot and the milk goes all over you. What a precarious situation to be in. We're not sitting on a one-legged stool with God. He's given us every provision so that we can grow in faith and in grace and in love for him. God has equipped us with a firm foundation with which to serve him and be filled with hope and faith and love and confidence every day. How many of you want those things in your life? Yes, we do. So today we break bread, which represents Christ's broken body for us. Let us be reminded that salvation is free. It's a gift. Gifts are free, right? A true gift has no strings attached by grace through faith. It's an unspeakable gift, you know, but it costs somebody a lot to get it for us. It's that which we want to think of today as we do this service. Grace is the message. It's the means. Faith is the method. Faith is the hand that lays hold of it. And our works, our good things that we do, are the evidence that we have joined to him. He made himself the servant of all our necessities. The Bible says he was wounded for our sins, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Have you had your peace chastised at, at one time or another in your life? Oh yes, but it all he took it all, it all went to him. 
Early Christians celebrated all of this, what we call the Lord's Supper, as, the, as an agape feast. They did this in the first century, clear up into the fourth century, according to history. They shared a meal in connection with the Lord's Supper. And they continued that well into the fourth century until the churches got so big that it wasn't practical to do it any, anymore. But in Corinth, it didn't work out too well. They had an agape feast, all right, but not everybody got food. That was the sad part of it. Some went hungry. Let's read about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 21 and 22. 1 Corinthians 11, 21 and 22. For in eating, everyone takes before other his own supper. And one is hungry, and another is drunken. In other words, one had something to drink and eat, and the other one didn't. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. You know, in, in Corinth, some things didn't work very well. In fact, there was a lot of things didn't work very well in the Corinth church. They were taking each other to court. And uh, it was almost kind of like a caste system in Corinth. There were first-class believers and second-class believers because of the economic conditions of the members in the church. In other words, their acceptance was based upon caste, upon their status. But the church and the gospel is the great leveler. We are all one in Christ. There are neither Jew nor Gentile. There are neither male nor female. There are neither rich nor poor. Spiritual pride is that poison that caused the trouble in heaven and that causes unworthiness even in the present day. That was the trouble of Corinth. And it wasn't only that. Like we met said, they were taking one another to court. There was a lot of immorality going on in that church. And they were, you know, sort of misusing the spiritual gifts also. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Especially one of them, the tongues. And uh, it was in this kind of a setting a few years before this, that Jesus took a basin and a towel. Who is he anyway? He's the creator God. He's the one who speaks and it's done. He's the one that created the universe. He takes in this setting a bowl and a towel and begins to wash the disciples' feet. And uh, contrast this with the pride that was in the disciples' heart, hearts. They were kind of vying for, they thought Jesus was going to set up a kingdom. And they were, they were sort of jealous of each other, worried that one of them was going to get the upper hand, right? And be on the right side of Jesus. There was a caste system in that little church of 11 or 12 people, right? He used this opportunity to teach a profound lesson to unworthy disciples who were striving for that first place. Prideful of their status in that church. The humility of Jesus summarizes his whole life. This little act summarizes his whole life of service to everyone. He became the servant of all of our necessities. We celebrate this today. May the Lord bring thanksgiving and conviction and happiness as we are focused upon what he did then and upon his coming again. The Bible says that the communion service points back for us, points back to the cross, points forward to his second coming. We should be joyful, right? This is not a time of sorrow. We're looking forward for Jesus to come. And he said that's how we should do it.